This is where it all began, and not only for Disney, but for feature-length animated films as a whole. Before this period, animation was just strictly confined to short cartoons. However, Walt Disney went above and beyond, even putting his house on the line to help create the very first animated features, an idea initially scoffed at. This is referred to as the golden era because of how influential and high quality these five films are. Speaking of quality, this begs today's question, which of these films is the worst and which is the best? Let's jump right in. I'm Caleb with Wicked Binge and this is Disney Golden Era Films Worst to Best. We start out with the 1937 Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs as the worst Golden Era film. Actually, weakest is a better term here because all five Golden Era films are phenomenal. Disney's very first animated film is based on the Brothers Grimm fairy tale, which is about a young girl named Snow White who runs into a forest to escape her stepmother wanting her death. And in the forest, she comes across a cottage that is home to seven dwarfs who she befriends. Let's go and get the big negatives out of the way first. Some of the characters are not the greatest. Snow White herself is very bare bones. She's just what you'd expect a 14-year-old girl of royalty from that time period would act. Very prim and proper with a motherly disposition. The Huntsman only exists to further the plot and the prince is just there really. This would all be a huge problem if this were a film made today, but since the waters were just being tested here, it's not fair to punish the film for it. Also, some of the sequences can drag on at times, particularly those involving the woodland animals. Now to the positives. The backgrounds are gorgeous and the character animation is fluid. If you wonder why Snow White moves so realistically at times, it's because of a process called rotoscoping, where animators trace over live action footage. Disney absolutely nailed their first ever villain. The shroud my clothes, the black of night. The Evil Queen is an intimidating force even when she's in her cartoony or older woman form, and the film's climax leading to her death was and still is one of Disney's darkest moments. And of course, we can't forget about the dwarfs. They carry this film and provide us with its greatest and most memorable scenes, with the sequences of them coming home from work and washing themselves being standouts. It can also be argued that Grumpy's gradual change of heart towards Snow White is the earliest example of character development in anything animated, however small. There is a reason why we're still talking about Snow White to this day. It paved the way for the rest of the films on this list as well as the entire medium of animated films in general. In fact, this channel wouldn't exist without it. So we pay a ton of gratitude for that, that's for sure. Next is the 1941's Dumbo. Based on the book by Helen Aberson and Harold Pearl, Dumbo was about the titular character, a young circus elephant born with massive ears. They are initially seen as a subject of ridicule, but it is eventually discovered that they give Dumbo the ability to fly. First things first, this is not the film you should be watching if you are in a sad mood. A good chunk of the film is simply heartbreaking, with Dumbo's mother being locked up only for protecting him, him being rejected by all the other elephants, and getting humiliated in a clown act in seemingly one fell swoop. Now let's get back to the happy stuff. Dumbo is a silent protagonist, so he has to rely on a wide range of facial expressions to convey his feelings, and the animators did a superb job you can immediately empathize with him while he doesn't utter a word. The cast is pretty small and not the most memorable, but it makes up for it with some good voice acting. The film marked the first Disney roles of eventual mainstays Verna Felton and Sterling Holloway, while Edward Brophy's performance as Timothy the Mouse is pretty solid. This is one of the shortest films in the Disney animated canon, clocking in at just over an hour. While most animated films this short are hindered by their runtime, a notable exception being 2011's Winnie the Pooh, Dumbo is a rare instance in which it manages to get across everything it needed to without feeling like something was missing. Speaking of something missing, let's discuss the elephant in the room. See what we did there? We cannot talk about this film without at least mentioning the pink elephants on parade sequence. 
Depending on your view of it, it's either the most terrifying thing ever or one of the greatest pieces of avant-garde animation ever created. And the crazy thing is, it was only animated by two people. But above all, it serves as an excellent PSA as to why kids shouldn't get drunk. Pink elephants aside, Dumbo is a true underdog story and has a message that is universal. Anyone can do anything regardless of what's on the outside. In third place, we have 1942's Bambi. Based on a book by Felix Salton, the film centers around the titular character, a young deer and future prince of the forest who learns about the trials and tribulations of life. With this film, the animators had to really do their homework. While Snow White had animal characters, they weren't at the forefront, so they could be stylized. Bambi, on the other hand, has animals as the focal point. So, real-life animals were studied so the characters could look and move as anatomically correct as possible. And it paid off in the end because the characters, while mostly cartoony, were some of the most realistic looking for its time. It is enjoyable watching Bambi grow up over time. Every tiny detail is showcased, from him struggling to get up after just being born, to him jumping and frolicking around as a child, and him walking confidently in strides as a young adult, just like a real life dear. Bambi has, without a doubt, some of the most beautiful artistry ever put into animation. The forest landscapes are beautifully painted backgrounds, and the movements of little objects like leaves and snow just add to the wildlife aesthetic. The seasons and lighting also help further convey what is happening. The spring represents birth and new beginnings, the heavy, bleak winter goes along well with the somber tone of the death of Bambi's mother, and the light during the happy moments perfectly complements the darker shading during the film's dark moments. And of course, that scene. The infamous aforementioned death of Bambi's mother is sad, sure, but what makes it sad is because of how perfectly it was executed. Bambi's mother was only implied to be dead when the gunshot was heard, and they could have easily had her come back wounded. It makes the hopeful audience all the more devastated when Bambi's father approaches and comes with the bad news. On that note, it is also ingenious not to have one clear villain. To have a looming threat only simply referred to as man just makes it more eerie. Bambi has had a tremendous impact on pop culture, whether it's for the characters or for being the point of reference for many parental deaths in animated films. It also has had a massive impact on anime and manga of all things. Osama Tezaku, the creator of such works as Astro Boy and Kimba the White Lion, allegedly went to see it in theaters 80 times. He loved the characters' large, expressive eyes so much that he gave them to his characters. If you've ever wondered why many anime characters have such large eyes, now you know. With all that such a simple little film like this managed to accomplish, no wonder why it's the number 3 spot. Getting the number 2 spot is 1940's Pinocchio. Based on the Italian novel by Carlo Collodi, it involves the title character, a wooden puppet, who is brought to life. In order to become a real boy, he must prove himself to be brave, truthful, and unselfish. As of writing, Pinocchio is the only film in the Disney animated canon to have a perfect 100% score on Rotten Tomatoes, and we can see why. While Snow White can easily pass off as several of Disney's silly symphony shorts put together, this film holds its own and is truly the studio's first grand scale adventure. It is the quintessential coming of age story, as we see Pinocchio grow from a young, impressionable kid to a more courageous and mature little boy. It's funny that the only thing most people think of when they hear the name Pinocchio is how his nose grows whenever he lies because it only happens once in the entire film. Anyway, aside from the story, the film's other strong point is the characters. Every single one of them is great and has their chance to shine. This is the film that gave us Jiminy Cricket, who acts as Pinocchio's conscience and has since become one of Disney's most popular and iconic characters. And we can't help but love Geppetto. He's such a sweet old man and who wouldn't want him as their grandfather? His kitten and goldfish, Figaro and Cleo, also have their own cute and fun brother-sister dynamic going. But without a doubt, the villains are the one that steal the show, with each one being bigger and more intimidating than the last. When taking all the allegories into account, the Coachman is one of the darkest and most realistic Disney villains of all time. 
He literally has little boys caught after being promised good things just for them to be sent off somewhere. And there is even a place along the way called Pleasure Island. We'll let you put two and two together and you'll be just as horrified as Honest John. And we can't forget Monstro the Whale, the nightmare of many young viewers. The climax involving him is just as epic, if not more so than climaxes of modern animated films, and the animation involved was way ahead of its time. Finally, we'd like to mention that Pinocchio was the film where When You Wish Upon a Star originated from, which you may recognize as Disney's unofficial anthem that plays during their logo. All in all, Pinocchio is an incredible film that set the precedent for other animated coming-of-age films going forward, and we highly recommend it. Finally, taking the number one spot for the best Disney golden era film is 1940's Fantasia. While Snow White and Pinocchio proved that animation could work in a feature-length film format, Fantasia proved that animation was capable of even more, particularly telling a cohesive narrative that only requires music with no dialogue needed. The film is a collection of eight animated segments set to various pieces of classical music conducted by Leopold Stokowski, with themes Taylor being the master of ceremonies who introduces each one. With so much to gush about, where do we even start? Well, the animation can only be described as otherworldly, still holding up beautifully even a whopping 80 years later. The style varies depending on the segment. It can range from abstract to cartoony to realistic to looking like a moving painting. Speaking of the segments, let's talk about them. Toccata and Fugue has various abstract shapes which reflect the sounds of the music. Second is several selections from the Nutcracker Suite that uses fairies, fish, flowers, mushrooms, and leaves to depict the changing of the seasons. The part that everyone remembers, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, follows. Originally conceived as a silly symphony short to bring Mickey Mouse back into popularity, it features Mickey as the titular apprentice, who tries out some of his master's tricks just for everything to spiral out of control. Fun fact, the sorcerer's name is Yen Sid. We'll leave you to decipher the easter egg, which is his name backwards. Rite of Spring is a visual history of the early days of the planet, progressing from the formation of Earth and its earliest life forms to the reign and extinction of the dinosaurs. This was 50 years before Jurassic Park, and the dinosaurs look amazing here. And the fight between the T-Rex and Stegosaurus is one of the highlights of the entire film. Right after the intermission is a demonstration of how sound is rendered on film, with the animated soundtrack almost acting as its own character. Next is the Pastoral Symphony, which sees a world of colorful characters from Greek mythology, such as centaurs, cupids, and pegasi going about their daily lives. We also see a festival being held to honor the cartoony god of wine Bacchus, with Zeus and Vulcan also appearing. Dance of the Hours follows a ballet featuring different animals that represent the time of day. The ostriches represent the morning, the hippos are the afternoon, the elephants are the evening, and the alligators represent night. The film's grand finale is Night on Bald Mountain, in which the devil Chernabog awakens and summons his spirits and restless souls throughout the night just to be driven away when dawn breaks. Heaven goes on to compliment Hell as monks make their way through a forest while a chorus sings Ave Maria. The one little nitpick we have with this film is that a few segments do tend to drag on, namely a rite of spring and dance of the hours, but that's very minor. To close this out, we also have to mention this film's major technological achievement. Early screenings made use of a process called Fantasound, which was the predecessor of a little thing you may have heard of called Surround Sound. Fantasia is nothing but a masterpiece that can never be replicated. Sure, its sequel Fantasia 2000 is okay at best, but it simply does not hold a candle to the original. This is a must watch for any film buff. But let us know in the comment section if you agree with our ranking, and tell us what we should cover next. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge more of our videos. But most importantly, stay wicked.